everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Sonia and I'm coming to you from the West Tennessee Delta Heritage Center in Brownsville, Tennessee. We're so glad that you chose to join us and I know you're going to enjoy this evening's guest. He has roots in Texas but he's been in Memphis for quite a while and he has a new album that's releasing this weekend. So please help me welcome to Songwriter Spotlight, Brian Blake. Brian, it's so nice to have you here and I'm really excited about your new album that is releasing this weekend. But first, tell me a little bit about how you got started um, with music. Well, I guess I've been into music you know, my whole life, my parents, like uh, a lot of kids of my generation, they had all the good stuff from the 50s and 60s and 70s um, on the radio and on the record players when I was growing up. So um, I've always been into kind of, kind of roots music, blues, um, country music, and, and that sort of thing. So it was always just on the radio or on the record player. Um, since I was born, <laughs> and um, and then I started playing guitar when I was around twelve, and then I started really taking it seriously um, by the time I was thirteen or fourteen, and have just been playing ever since. So, I mean, that's going on thirty plus years now. Um, I've been playing in and around the Memphis area, um, and various various mutations of that, you know, over the years. Um, started out playing a lot of blues and then um, got got kind of more into kind of rock and started doing that. Um, in the early 2000s, I was in a power trio where we, we did stuff kind of like ZZ Top and Cream and Government Mule. And so it was a little, a little bit heavier than the blues, but it was all blues influenced. And, um, and then I kind of retired for a little bit and started having my family and um, stopped playing music out as much, but I still played around occasionally and at the house a lot. And, um, and then in the last 10 years or so, um, I've just been, been writing a lot and, um, and doing more acoustic folk and Americana kind of style of music. Did you teach yourself the guitar or lessons? Yes, I taught, I was self-taught. So I play by ear, I don't read music or anything like that. <laughs> well, tell me a little bit about your songwriting. When did you consciously begin to start writing your own music? Yeah, I, I attempted a long time ago in my teens, um, but they were mostly like copies of other songs, you know, that I would hear and and unconsciously I would kind of rearrange the the melodies a little bit and put words together that weren't very meaningful. <laughs> and um and it wasn't until about ten years ago, um maybe maybe it's been eight or nine years ago, um, that I really started songwriting. And I started gravitating towards um folk musicians like Guy Clark, Towns Van Zandt. Um, John Prine and those sorts and just really getting into the um, more acoustic music of that genre whatever that is and um, and listening to the words you know which were sometimes funny sometimes very deep um, but always kind of had a story to tell and that's the kind of stuff that I heard also growing up but it wasn't until later that, you know, it kind of clicked. And, um, and so I started, started songwriting kind of in that area um, eight or nine years ago. And it was really at the suggestion of my father, we were in Houston um, where, where I was born and I was visiting him and um, we went to see a cousin of mine and cousin was a musician I didn't know it I'd never met the cousin before kind of kind of you know third cousin twice removed or something and um that I had never met and he was 
writing song. He was playing songs that he had written about our hometown, which is my family. So my dad's side of hometown is in Liberty, Texas, and it's it's a small town that's in between Houston and Beaumont on Highway 90. And um, so my cousin was playing these songs that I could tell were about liberty, and um, and I was just really struck by that. But they were all kind of depressing songs, you could say, because he didn't have a very good experience there in Liberty. <laughs> and because um, he was, it was a small town, 1950s, and he was an artistic kid, kind of outsider. And um, so his, his view of things there um, differed than the average small towner. And so, I, afterwards, I told my dad, I said, well, somebody should write some happy songs about liberty. And uh, my dad said, well, you should do that. And I was like, hmm. And I'd never really entertained songwriting up to that point as something serious that I could do or should do. And so that kind of started me on that. And, um, and I've been writing ever since. So in... Uh, Last year, 2021, I was named Memphis Songwriter Association Songwriter of the Year, um, so I'm proud of that. And um, so, you know, his suggestion has prompted a whole lot of uh, enjoyment in the songwriting process. Do you have a happy song about liberty? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> so. Um, so you never wrote those songs about liberty? No, they all start. Uh, I started writing, and the first song. Uh, I started writing um, was a song called Nothing Gold Can Stay, which is about liberty. And I was just sitting there and um, and the opening line um, goes something like, um, what's become of my hometown, everything on Maine is closing down. And Phil the barber is dead and gone. <laughs> and um, so it, I, I started writing that and uh, and it, it wasn't necessarily that they needed to be happy songs, but um, but the the prompt was there to get me to start writing, and so that that was great. And I've been working on on the songwriting for a number of years now, and um, ultimately have I've created a kind of a body of work of songs that are for more or less about. The Liberty area, my family, because we go back more than 170 years there, and um, and so I started writing these songs, and the basis of my upcoming album are these songs about liberty. What's the story behind the first song you're going to play for us? So I think I'll do "Move On, JD," and that's the song that I won the uh, songwriter award for last year. Um, and I'd seen this photograph on a Facebook group, a black and white photo of a man sitting on a curb, um, drinking a beer, and he had one arm. And uh, he kind of looked vaguely familiar to me. And, um, and this was from a Facebook group from Liberty in Texas. And uh, everybody was writing comments about this guy turns out his name was J.D. Lowe and he was a homeless World War II veteran and uh, quite the character um, and I remember seeing him around town when I was a young boy when I'd go to Liberty and visit my grandparents and uh, knew some other people that knew him as well. So anyway, um, heard about J.D., saw this picture and I wrote this song and um, it kind of came out of nowhere wasn't expecting to write a song about this, but I did. So it's called Move On JD.
behind the old man Wiggins' store. And he'd smile at all the passers-by as he nursed on the past cold. Let's say, well, move on, move on, J.D. inspired by a photograph for that but what else inspires you and tell us a little bit about the creative process that takes place for you to 
create these songs? Usually it's like I'll be inspired. I, I have almost like a, uh, I'll get these songwriting fits where I'll, I'll get an idea or hear a phrase or see a picture. Um, and once the, once I get that, I, I just latch onto it and I keep writing and working on that song until it's a song. And um, I don't have generally a lot of things, songs that I've got in line, you know, that are working, or I, I don't have like a fishbowl of ideas or something. And um, like John Prine, when he wrote his last album, they sent him to a hotel for a week and with all these scraps of paper ideas that he had collected over the last 10 or 15 years since his last album. And he went into a hotel and wrote the album Tree of Forgiveness in a week or 10 days or something like that. And, uh, but well, he's prolific and great and can do that sort of thing. And I, that's just not how I do. So I, I tend to work on something for um, days, weeks, months, or years. You know, like that song, Nothing Gold Can Stay, which is the closer of the upcoming album, was, you know, start to finish an eight year song. Move On JD took a couple of months, a few months maybe. Um, I've had some that um, I've written in a few days, but not many, so. So are you writing some every day? Do you try to make yourself do that or? Um, I don't, I know a lot of people do, um, and I would probably do well to do that, but that's, you know, generally I'll write when I'm inspired to write. And so with that song, it was just, it was me working on that and doing other things. You know, I, I play shows and gigs and, you know, I get my family, so I'm not a full-time songwriter or musician. Uh, if I, if I were, I would be doing it all day, every day, um, and that would be great because <laughs> it's a lot of fun, you know, the creative process. It's, it's, it's hard, it's challenging, um, it can be gut-wrenching, you're unsure sometimes if what you're doing is any good or worth it or whatever, but at the end, you know, you come out with a, with a, a piece of art, you know, like a painting or a drawing or something like that. Are the words coming first or the melody? Um, usually I kind of do them at the same time. So like I'll have, I'll get the idea for the song. Um, a song that I play that people like to hear is called, um, well, it's a short title, it's Copay. But one night um, I was with my better half <laughs> We were at home and uh, she looked into the bottom of her pill bottle and said, oh Lord, I'm just a copay away from being crazy. And, um, and I ran and grabbed my guitar and started writing a song around that theme. And, um, and so I usually get struck by, by something, you know, photo, phrase, an idea or whatever. And then I just latch onto it and hammer it. <laughs> hammer it until it's dead. Well, being a storyteller is a good thing. Tell me the story of New Year's Day. Yeah, so um, New Year's Day is, uh, you know, one of those songs, um, partly truth, partly fiction. And a friend of mine, um, she sent me a used coffee mug in the mail um, back during the pandemic. It's a, random gift that I got, which was really cool. And, um, and I started writing this song. It was a, it was a coffee mug and it had a bunch of, it had Mark Twain's picture on it and a bunch of phrases, things that Mark Twain had said or written. And, um, and so I started writing the song around this coffee mug and, and, and actually I, I sent her a, picture of the mug on her birthday and I was like here I'm, happy birthday I'm taking a picture with my favorite mug and um, and she goes oh you should write a song about that and so I, I was like okay and, and I just started tootling around with that 
Mark Twain idea, and, um, and it was it was kind of getting a little too happy for me, so I decided to kind of reverse course and make it into a, a song about a lost love and a man who has this coffee mug um, and is looking back on his lost love, and um, and so that song started somewhere you know about a mark twain coffee mug and went somewhere totally different <laughs> and uh, this is going to be one of the singles on the album it's called new year's day batch of songs um, some of which are about my family and about my hometown in Liberty Texas 
and um, and those finally came together. I think uh, during the pandemic, I I finished what um, what I thought would be good enough for an album, and um, got eleven songs. Um, went down to Austin earlier in this year uh, in February, and then again in May, uh, and recorded in Austin with. Walt Wilkins, um, who's a great songwriter and record producer, um, and Walt was Walt's from Austin, but he was in Nashville for a number of years too. Um, Walt and Ron Flint uh, co-produced the album, um, recorded in Austin at Jumping Dog Studios. Um, had some of Austin's best session musician musicians backing me up on it. Um, Rich Brotherton, who played for Robert O'Keefe for 20 years, Warren Hood, who's a accomplished uh, fiddler, virtuoso fiddler, um, just a number of great musicians backing me up uh, on the album, and it, I'm really excited to get it out there. It's been a, just years in the making, and you know, with the pandemic kind of slowing things down for everybody. Um, in all lines of work, uh, including art, um, you know, kind of, kind of put the brakes on that for a little bit, and that's fine. Um, but I'm, I'm glad we've gotten through this recording process, and uh, really looking forward to getting these songs out there. I think they're songs that will resonate with people, um, and people, like I said, they have characters and themes that are familiar, familiar. And relatable um, to everybody. How will people be able to find it? Um, so they'll be able to find it on brianblake.net anywhere I'm playing live but it'll also be on all the platforms um, you know Amazon, Apple, Spotify and um, Bandcamp and all the places where you, where you get your your music will be there. Um, we're having a big uh, release show it's going to be at Crosstown Green Room on October 29th. Um, I've got I've got a great backing band for that. Um, some of Memphis's best players are going to be supporting me in that. Um, Alice Hazen, Bailey Bigger, Aaron Brame, uh, and a number of Dan Cochran and another number of others are going to kind of back me up. And we're going to we're going to play the album. We're going to play a bunch of other songs that are some of my favorites to play by some of my songwriting heroes. So, <laughs> um, is it going to be a physical album or CD, or is it all just going to be streaming? I will have CD initially, and I'm I'm on the wait list right now for vinyl, which everybody else is trying to do. Vinyl is also on the wait list, um, but it's a it's a six to nine month wait list. So. That, that won't be out until after sometime in 2023. But the CDs will have, um, they're basically ready right now, and then we'll be available at the release show too. Um, and at the show we'll have merch and posters and all that kind of good stuff too. After, after that, I'm planning to do some uh, small tour um, in the Southeast and in Texas playing some days to support the album and get it out there. Um, and that'll go on through the spring of next year. So. Let's talk a little bit about a song I know is not on the uh, album that's coming up. Tell me about The Scamp. Okay. The Scamp is a song, um, you know, when I started really, well, I, I've been a fan of Jerry Jeff Walker um, for a long time, and part of that was unconscious. Um, where I grew up listening to that sort of stuff because it was on the radio or the record player, um, kind of that outlaw country genre. And, um, and then later when I, when I started, you know, really getting into that genre, um, he was just one of the icons. You know, there's Jerry Jeff, Waylon, Willie Nelson, Chris Christopherson, Doug Som, um, and, all sorts of others. And uh, Jerry Jeff was one I latched on to. Guy Clark, of course, Towns Van Zandt. Um, all, those, all those songwriters are, are just heroes and mythical figures. And, um, and so 
Jerry Jeff passed away during the pandemic, and uh, and that it wasn't pandemic related, um, but that really hit me hard, and ended up um, not purposely, but wrote wrote the song "The Scamp" about Jerry Jeff. Okay. <laughs> That's, that's my main thing. I'm not very good at Instagram and stories and reels and all that. I'm terrible at it. Um, but I do post quite a bit on Facebook. 
Um, just look up Brian Blake, um, Brian Blake guitar. You'll see me standing there with a the guitar. And um, I'm also on Instagram, and I think that's at Brian Blake guitar. Um, my website, brianblake.net. And usually on the website, uh, keep it really up to date with where I'll be playing um, around uh, anywhere from three to six or seven shows a month um, in and around Memphis. So, Well, introduce your guest to us. Yeah, this is my good friend Aaron Brain. I've known Aaron a long time, um, a real long time. <laughs> and uh, we go back to grade school um, together. So we grew up uh, together in Germantown. Didn't live too far from one another, a couple miles maybe. And um, and we've been we've been friends for a long time, and um, for a period there, just getting older and raising families and stuff, um, we didn't hang out so much. But we've reconnected in the past year or two, and it's really been good. And Aaron's, uh, we had our first band together way back in 1993, <laughs> and um, and it was a garage band, and uh, we were just kids trying to figure out music. And we were playing Willie Dixon songs on Beale Street when we were teenagers, yeah. so yeah. it was all right. Yeah, exactly. And you were playing the accordion? I was, no, I was playing the uh, piano. Uh, playing my world, sir, piano. Right. Mm -hmm. And a Casio keyboard. Yeah. <laughs> I think the accordion is, what, the past couple years? It's a pandemic maybe? project, yeah. yes. Yeah. But um, but it's, you know, it's it's good to um, play music with, with this kind of thing, accordion complements it nicely, so with the kind of folk sort of music. Um, well, tell us what song y'all are gonna do. Yeah, so we'll do Book of Life, and this is uh, the title track of the upcoming album. Um, so most of the songs, like I mentioned, are songs about family, places in and around Liberty, and um, and this, this song uh, I wrote actually right before the pandemic happened um, and it's another one of those that that came out pretty quickly but I didn't do a whole lot with and then um, once the pandemic happened I, I started working on it more and then when we went to record it in Austin um, it was originally not going to be the title track but when we did the recording uh, and, and, and heard it um, heard the playbacks of it I was like, yeah, this needs to be the title track. So it's called Book of Life. Yeah. 
I hope you've enjoyed Brian and his music, and I hope that you are getting ready to start looking for this new album that's going to be debuting this weekend. Be sure and get you a copy and support our local songwriters. Brian, thank you so much for being here. It's been a pleasure, and Aaron, you too. Now, we were talking a little earlier, and I learned that you include one of our Brownsville Bluesman song in your show. So, how about playing us out with that song? We'll do it. Yeah, I love, um, I was really heavily influenced by Taj Mahal uh, growing up. Um, and it's, um, most people wouldn't know it, but um, he influenced everybody from the Allman Brothers on up. You know, he's, he's a revolutionary guy. And um, part of that was playing the older blues generations songs like Sleepy John um, and Henry Thomas and Mississippi Fred McDowell and Lightning Hopkins and all those sorts of people. And he kind of introduced new generations to that kind of music. And um, he put Diamond Duck Blues on his, I think it was Taj's first album, um, kind of rocked it up a little bit, you know, it was really cool. And, um, and then later years, um, I've seen him do it with Kev Mo, who's another huge influence of mine, and um, and they did it together on their uh, album they put out a few years ago called Taj Mo, I think, and um, so that's kind of the version that I do is the Taj and and Kev Mo version of Diamond Duck Blues, but. <laughs> Thank you.